so our first topic for today is progressional supraventricular tachycardia uh, remember that progressional supraventricular tachycardia uh, it is called progressional uh, supraventricular tachycardia uh, because it starts and it starts suddenly and it uh, ends abruptly as well so starts suddenly and ends abruptly that's why it is called paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia how to diagnose paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia on ecg in previous lecture we discussed that if an if an old man uh, who is uh, older than 65 years of age present to us with syncope or fainting or mild exercise tolerance uh, then we will suspect aortic stenosis for paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia uh, the main points or the hints or the diagnosis of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia is that uh, this uh, type of tachycardia it is common in young patient so if a young patient present to you with palpitation light headedness and these palpitations are recurrent because paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia as i told you that it starts and it ends abruptly so the episodes will be recurrent uh, this type of tachycardia is very common in young people so if a young person present to you with palpitation then you will suspect paroxysmal ventricular uh, supraventricular tachycardia any patient who present to you with palpitation the first thing that you will do is to uh, do an ecg how we are going to diagnose paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia on ecg the diagnostic point for this type of tachycardia on ecg is that it is a narrow complex tachycardia narrow complex tachycardia normally the normal width of qrs complex is two and a half small boxes or 100 milliseconds so the normal width of qrs complex is two and a half small boxes or 100 milliseconds what will be a narrow qrs complex if the qrs complex is less than 100 millisecond then we'll say that it's a narrow qrs complex so if a young person present to you with palpitation and on ecg there is narrow complexes plus tachycardia then we'll say that it's paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia let me show you an ecg of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia as you can see in this diagram the complexes are very narrow just like a straight thin lines in almost one small box and also the heart rate is very fast because uh, there are there is only one large box Uh, between two r waves almost one large box so the heart rate here is 300 divided by 1 it's almost 300 275 or 300 so the two hints or two clinches for the diagnosis of supraventricular tachycardia are present in this ecg one is it is a tachycardia and the second one is it is a narrow complex tachycardia so that's how supraventricular tachycardia is diagnosed on the basis of ecg let me show you another diagram to make thing more clear just give me a minute a bigger diagram so the diagnostic point for 
supraventricular tachycardia is narrow complexes and regular tachycardia. Let's see in this diagram as well. So this is a more clear diagram for supraventricular tachycardia. You can see that the width of QRS complexes is almost one small box, and one small box is 40 milliseconds. So we can say that these QRS complexes are narrow QRS complexes. And also, after QRS complexes, there is T wave, but you cannot identify any P waves. Actually, P waves are buried inside the T waves. That's why we cannot identify any P waves. There is one other arrhythmia, which is atrial fibrillation, in which uh, there are no P waves. Similar is the case in supraventricular tachycardia. Here, there are no P waves as well. In atrial fibrillation, the QRS complexes are also narrow. And in supraventricular tachycardia, the QRS complexes are also narrow. So how uh, we are going to differentiate between atrial fibrillation and supraventricular tachycardia? There is only one difference. Supraventricular tachycardia is a regular narrow complex tachycardia. What does this mean? A regular narrow complex tachycardia means the QRS complexes are regular. They are not irregular. While in atrial fibrillation, uh, the QRS complexes are irregular. So regular narrow complex tachycardia is supraventricular tachycardia and irregular narrow complex tachycardia is atrial fibrillation with no P waves. So absent P waves plus regular narrow complex tachycardia, it will be SVT as shown in the diagram. Absent P waves, irregular narrow complex tachycardia, it will be atrial fibrillation. Uh, is this point clear to everyone? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, but can you repeat the last sentence? You said which one is regular, which one is irregular? Let me show you the diagram of atrial fibrillation and then you will see what I'm talking about. You can see here that this diagram is similar to the one that I have shown you. Here, you can see that the QRS complexes are narrow. In ventricular tachy or supraventricular tachycardia, the QRS complexes are narrow as well. So both of them have uh, narrow QRS complexes and absence of P wave. So absent P waves and narrow QRS complexes are present in both. But here you can see that the RR interval is not regular. This RR interval is one, two, three, four, five, six small boxes. And this one is almost 10 small boxes. So this RR interval is not regular. So irregular narrow complex tachycardia is atrial fibrillation. And regular narrow complex tachycardia is supraventricular tachycardia. Perfect, clear. So a young patient present to us with palpitation and ECG shows a narrow complex, narrow complex tachycardia, a regular tachycardia, the diagnosis will be supraventricular tachycardia. What is the management of supraventricular tachycardia? 
the initial management is well silver maneuver and carotid massage well silver maneuver will lead to an increase in the pressure in the neck veins or in the neck area and increase in the pressure will stimulate the uh, vagus nerve through barrow receptors and the vagus nerve will slow slow down the heart rate so carotid massage and well silver maneuver uh, they are initial line management or paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia if there is no improvement with the salva maneuver or carotid massage then we will try the drug of choice for paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia is adenosine initially 6 mg iv bolus will be given and then an ecg will be performed if there is no improvement then additional 12 mg of adenosine will be given if still no improvement then again another bolus of 12 mg of adenosine will be given remember that adenosine causes a bronchoconstriction so if an asthmatic patient present to you with proximal supraventricular tachycardia then you will not give him adenosine for the treatment of proximal supraventricular tachycardia instead of adenosine uh, we will give a drug uh, a calcium channel blocker a cardio selective calcium channel blocker which is verapamil so in normal population the treatment of pharmacological treatment of psvt is adenosine while in asthmatics it is contraindicated because it causes uh, smooth muscle contraction or bronchoconstriction so that's why it will worsen the symptoms of asthma so in asthmatics we will give a uh, calcium channel blocker such as verapamil so initially well silva maneuver or carotid massage if no improvement then adenosine uh, in three doses 6 mg 12 mg and 12 mg and if still no improvement even after giving adenosine then we will go for dc cardioversion dc cardioversion is the last option for the treatment of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia so this is the emergency treatment of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia to prevent future episodes uh, we will prescribe beta blockers or radio frequency ablation can also be done so the emergency treatment is adenosine and dc cardioversion after vasalva maneuver and carotid massage and the long term treatment is beta blockers or radio frequency ablation so a narrow complex regular tachycardia is supraventricular tachycardia while a broad complex regular tachycardia if the complexes are broad and the tachycardia is regular then what will be your diagnosis can anyone recall from the previous lecture and give me the answer a broad complexes tachycardia on ecg a broad complexes regular tachycardia on ecg what will be the diagnosis ventricular tachycardia BT. excellent yes yeah. ventricular tachycardia let me show you a diagram to refresh the things a little bit you can see in this diagram that the qrs complexes are broad this is r wave the small one and this is s wave so this is a broad qrs complex and the patient is having tachycardia because you can calculate the small boxes 1 2 3 4 5 there are almost five small boxes or one large box between two r waves so the heart rate is here 300 in this ecg as well so it's a tachycardia and the complexes are broad remember that the broad qrs complexes they are all of one shape so we can say that it is a monomorphic broad complex tachycardia 
monomorphic broad complex tachycardia is ventricular tachycardia there's one other term that is polymorphic broad complex tachycardia let me show you a diagram so you can differentiate between monomorphic broad complex tachycardia and polymorphic broad complex tachycardia Just give me a minute. So in this TCD, you can see that uh, uh, the shape of QRS complexes is different. Here, the amplitude of the QRS complexes is high. And these are low amplitude QRS complexes. Again, some are high and some are low voltage or low amplitude. QRS complexes, such type of, uh, but still they are broad QRS complexes. So we will call it as a polymorphic broad complexes tachycardia. So polymorphic broad complex tachycardia, remember that polymorphic broad complex tachycardia is torsade D point is. So monomorphic broad complex tachycardia is ventricular tachycardia. Polymorphic broad complex tachycardia is torsade point is. Sorry, and narrow can you complex. Explain that again, please. This one, the torsade is D point is. Torsade is D point is uh, is a polymorphic uh, broad complex tachycardia. Yeah. You can see in this ECG that the person is having tachycardia because the heart rate is very high. The second thing that you can appreciate in this ECG is that the QRS complexes are broad. And the third thing that you can uh, see in this ECG is that the shapes of the QRS complexes is not same. You can see the shape of these QRS complexes, and then you can see the shape of these QRS complexes, and here as well, that the QRS complexes are of different shapes. There are many shapes of QRS complexes in this ECG, so that's why it is called polymorphic. Polymor poly means mean, uh, many and morphic means shape or morphology so what will happen with the um, regular or irregular so it looks irregular so uh, yes it's uh, it looks irregular but you can see that uh, the qrs complexes are regular okay the question is not about the uh, regularity here you can see that the shapes of the different QRS complexes is different. Okay. But they are occurring at a regular interval. Thank you. Here, here the interval is regular. Again, here, at, in this half of the ECG, the intervals are regular as well. Here, the intervals are regular as well. So, in simple words, polymorphic broad complex tachycardia is torsade D point is. Monomorphic broad complex tachycardia is ventricular tachycardia. And narrow complex tachycardia or regular narrow complex tachycardia is supraventricular tachycardia. And irregular one is atrial fibrillation. I hope uh, these points are clear to everyone. If there is any question, anyone want to ask, uh, then he can ask. So, so said the point is, is basically polymorphic broad complex tachycardia as shown is in this diagram as well. So, or said deep point is can be caused by drugs as well as it can be caused by a syndrome which is known as long QT syndrome. Long QT syndrome can lead to torsade deep point is and ventricular tachycardia as well. 
So long QT syndrome is a risk factor for ventricular tachyarrhythmias. That's why it's important to know that what is a long QT syndrome and what are its causes. So long QT syndrome is basically QT interval on ECG, normal QT interval on ECG represent the ventricular repolarization. So if there's problem with the, and the ventricular is repolarized due to movement of potassium ions through potassium channels that are present in the cardiac membrane. So if there's problem with the potassium channels, uh, there will be problem with the repolarization of the heart, which will lead to a long QT interval, which is known as long QT syndrome. So long QT syndrome can be congenital or it can be acquired as well. In congenital uh, long QT syndrome, there's a genetic defect in the potassium channels, uh, which leads to a long QT interval. And the patient is a, at a risk of uh, developing ventricular arrhythmias. While on the other hand, uh, the acquired QT syndrome is caused by electrolyte abnormalities such as low blood calcium or low blood potassium. And there are some drugs such as antiarrhythmic drugs and some antibiotics and, and some antipsychotics. Uh, they can also cause uh, long QT syndrome. Example of antibiotic which can cause uh, long QT syndrome is azithromycin. Certain antiarrhythmic drugs can also cause long QT syndrome. So there are two types of long QT syndrome. One is congenital, uh, which is present in uh, children or in young people. And the other one is acquired QT syndrome, which can be caused by electrolyte imbalance and drugs as well. How a patient of long QT syndrome is gonna to present to you Remember that a patient with long QT syndrome, they are, uh, if during sternal exercise, such as swimming or marathon running or any other sternal exercise activity can lead to the development of arrhythmia in patient with a long QT syndrome. So if a child who present to you with recurrent fainting episodes and prolonged QT intervals on ECG and history of similar ECG during childhood, then you will think of congenital long QT syndrome. So basically a child with recurrent fainting episodes, you will suspect congenital long QT syndrome. As I told you before that long QT syndrome can lead to ventricular tachyarrhythmia, such as torsade D point A's. And torsade D point A's is a polymorphic, broad complex ventricular tachycardia. So prolonged QT interval, fainting episodes, patient might be a young athlete and the episodes will be recurrent. In the PLAB1 exam, a scenario like this will be given that a young athlete while during a marathon run suddenly become unconscious and he was brought to the hospital. And the ECG shows long QT interval, what is the most likely diagnosis. Then you will select torsade D point A's. And the treatment for torsade D point A is IV magnesium sulfate. Another ECG of torsade D point A's, you can see in this diagram that uh, the QRS complexes are broad and they have many shapes. Some QRS complexes have a larger amplitude and someone, some has a smaller amplitude. So it's basically polymorphic QRS complexes and they are broad. So it will make the diagnosis of 
or say the voltages because the polymorphic board complexes like cardiac or say the voltages can you show on the ecg uh, the long uh, qt interval please uh, remember that the normal length of uh, the normal length of qt interval is almost uh, for 30 milliseconds 430 to 450 milliseconds in this diagram you can see but when the person is having tachycardia then we need to calculate the corrected qt interval because in tachycardia uh, the qt interval uh, will be short due to tachycardia so in such cases we will need to calculate as you can see in this diagram in this part of the strip of the ecg the person is having tachycardia so it's not possible to calculate qt interval in such cases in tachycardia for these cases we need to calculate a corrected qt interval for which there is a specific complex mathematical formula which is usually incorporated into the automatic ecg machine so the qt interval is automatically calculated by the ecg machines okay. and it is given by the ecg machines to you automatically but if this part of the ecg strip you can count the small boxes and see if it's long qt interval or not qt interval is uh, from the start of q wave to the end of e wave so we, you will need to count the small boxes starting from the start of q wave and to the end of e wave let's see if we can calculate the qt interval in this diagram we will start counting from here let me zoom the diagram uh this i am telling you uh, just uh, as an example otherwise the corrected qt interval is calculated automatically by the ecg machine 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 12 13 14 so up to this point this is the end of the t wave it almost 14 small boxes so from where you started i started from the start of the q wave here okay. mm-hmm. from the start of the q wave to the end of the t wave it's almost 14 small boxes right so it's prolonged because 14 small boxes is 560 milliseconds and the normal qt qt interval is 430 to 450 milliseconds so okay. qt interval of more than 450 milliseconds is a long qt interval okay thank you of torsade d point is is iv magnesium sulfate now our next topic is left bundle branch block left bundle branch block remember that if there is a new onset of or new left bundle branch block or if the person is having a new left bundle branch block remember that a new left bundle branch block is equal to a myocardial infarction the management of left bundle branch block will be same as of st elevation mi so a new left bundle branch block in any patient is equal to st elevation mi 
how we are going to diagnose left bundle branch graft on ECG. Remember the criteria for the diagnosis of left bundle branch block. The first criteria is there will be a deep inverted QRS complexes in lead V1. For example, as shown in this diagram, you can see that there is a deep S wave. The first negative wave is S wave and the first positive wave is R wave. So this one is the first negative wave in V1, which is deep. Normally, uh, the wave is not that much deep in a normal ECG. So a deep and inverted QRS complexes in lead V1. And Notch, notched M shaped Borod QRS complexes in lead 1 AVL and V6. Basically, you can say that broad complexes or M shaped QRS complexes in lateral leads, lateral ECG leads such as 1 AVL and V6, all three of them are lateral ECG leads, and deep inverted QRS complexes in V1. Let me show you a bigger ECT. So you can see in this ECT that in V1, uh, the QRS complexes are inverted. So this QRS complexes, this QRS complex is inverted and it is deep and it is broad. We will start you can start or you can calculate the small boxes starting from here up to this point. So it's almost one, two, three, four, four small boxes. So the length of the QRS complex is 160 milliseconds. And normal QRS complex is 100 to 120 milliseconds. So again, Broad and inverted QRS complexes one and M shaped and broad QRS complexes in V six one and AVL. If this criteria is met, then our diagnosis will be left bundle branch block. Again, what is the criteria for the diagnosis of left bundle branch block? Broad QRS complexes in which leads M shaped broad QRS complexes in one AVL and V6 and inverted or W shaped QRS complexes in V1. So, if these two criteria are met, then it will make a diagnosis of left bundle branch block. You can see in this ECG as well that there are broad QRS complexes in one AVL and V6. So M-shaped or broad QRS complexes in three leads, in three lateral leads, which are one AVL and V6. So will it be lateral MR? Yes. It can be lateral MI. Okay. And a deep inverted QRS complex in V1, our diagnosis will be left bundle branch block. And the new left bundle branch block will be treated as ST elevation MI. So if they ask you about the management of a patient with a new left bundle branch block, then if the patient present to you uh, within uh, 12 hours of the onset of the symptoms, then the initial management or the most important management will be percutaneous coronary intervention. And if PCA is not available, then you will go for thrombolysis such as alteplase. So don't forget this point. 
now how right pendal branch block can be diagnosed on ecg you can differentiate right bundle branch block and left bundle branch block uh, by looking uh, at the qrs complexes in lead v1 in left bundle branch block the qrs complexes were inverted and w shaped as in this diagram while in right bundle branch block the qrs complexes are like this it, they are forming an m this is the formation of an m in the v1 there is an r wave so as i already uh, told you that the first positive wave is r wave so this is this small wave is r wave then this negative wave is s wave 